Hi. Welcome to Artist and Critic. I'm Don Gray. We're continuing the third part of a program talking about the human figure in art. And we're not approaching it chronologically. We're simply moving back and forth throughout the history of painting of the human figure to explore what it tells us about the artists who created them or perhaps the mood of the time, the temper of the time, uh, perhaps with a final point of illuminating the present conditions of art and the reasons why our art in contemporary America and in the contemporary world uh, looks the way it does. Okay, in the first uh, picture we look at a manuscript page which we finished the second part with uh, done in the late 10th century uh, and the subject is the baptism of Christ, the ornamentalism of the page and the two dimensionality of the design are apparent and there's a certain pleasure of color that's in the uh, picture. Now I I'm showing this because uh, later we're going to compare it to a two-dimensional contemporary work and it's my thesis that uh, two-dimensional work generally is lacking in the possibilities of the depth of expression of three-dimensional work. Now I'm, I realize that I'm that's a fairly broad statement and I don't mean to say that the two-dimensionality of Van Gogh or Gauguin or the two-dimensional aspects of Cezanne or anybody of that stature limits them. I'm just saying that the way the second dimension has been approached in contemporary painting it is an indication of superficiality, of really an unwillingness and an inability to go to the third dimension and it, uh, this poverty of conception and creative ability has been uh, raised to the level of of a god in the sense that we've deified our own impotence in a sense we've deified the the two the second the two dimensional artwork and when really we're we're saying uh, look what I can't do look how badly I can't do what I can't do see in a sense so uh, to my mind what gives the meaning to this uh, late 10th century a piece is the religious meaning that's implied, the, the uh, uh, subject of the baptism of Christ, the serious intensity with which it must have been created by the artist who painted it, perhaps a monk, prob probably a monk, and certainly there is a beauty, abstract beauty, in the two-dimensional design itself. But let's move from this to the vivid three-dimensionality of the Resurrection of Christ by Piero della Francesca, the 15th century a Renaissance painter, which we skipped over last time due to an error on my part. And we're showing it because it is not only a beautiful design, a magnificent design, in which uh, Christ, the central figure, risen from the to tomb, uh, ready to do battle, in a sense, against the forces of evil, where he holds almost uh, his own banner like a warrior striding forward. Uh, he not only grips us because he's in the center, because of the marvelous hypnotic quality of his personality, the power of his personality, but through the cleverness of design, the uh, barren trees on the left come diagonally forward to the focal point of a triangle in space, which is Christ, and recedes the other side with trees that are in, in, in foliage, perhaps saying that Christ gives new life to the dead, whether they're trees or people. And there's another triangle, if we want to get in the composition, where the head of Christ is the apex, or the top of the flag is the apex, and we go down either side of his body to the sloping backs of the sleeping Roman soldiers below, and their buttocks on the ground level <coughs> form the base of a triangle, and, and some of the figures are small triangles themselves, as, as you can note. But it's not only the marvelous aesthetics of this picture which make it a masterpiece, but it's the profound content. It's the message. It's the story. Uh, you, you'll hear, well, the story of, of the painting. You'll hear that idea derided in the 20th century because we've abandoned that ship and clung to the sinking life raft of aesthetics for their own sake. How did he use his red against his green? Did he drip his pink properly? And did he use his paint roller? effectively, this kind of thing. But the, 
A painting of this depth and magnitude and power as Della Francesca's is probing the origins of humanity in a sense, human thought, human perception of man's place in the uh, universe in a sense, is, is probing deep within man for the Christ that's within man in a sense as well as the Christ that's outside of man. The, this painting is dealing with ultimate human issues and it happens to be clothed in magnificent aesthetics. Uh, the two go together. I will never deride aesthetics, but when they try to get along by themselves, and paltrily so, as they do in 20th century where we stain a canvas or we splatter a little bit of this here, we put masking tape there, we put a, poke a hole in this, or we pile a little piece of lumber here against a brick, uh, it, it just can't cut the human need for profundity for meaning. It's, it's simply superficial. All right, and another example of powerful, profound art would be this painting by Rembrandt of Jeremiah lamenting the destruction of Jerusalem. This would be 17th century uh, Dutch. And we see the power of the forms, the aesthetics again, the use of light and dark to model the forms, their solidity, the expressiveness of the light and darkness, and the content of the piece, the story of the piece, the deep human sorrow that something of great meaning to mankind has been destroyed uh, is in a sense some aspect of our own religiosity or our need for spiritual feelings or spiritual rebirth has been destroyed. So it's, just, it's something deep in ourselves has been destroyed. So it's extremely profound. So keep in mind the profundity of this and the solidity of it and the convincing nature of the whole painting. And we move to Willem de Kooning in the 20th century, two nudes. Now in a sense, we could co have compared this directly to the manuscript page of the Baptism of Christ we started the program with. Uh, and, and, and what is the message here? Now there's a certain convincing uh, manipulation of contemporary aesthetics. I mean, one of the rules of contemporary expressionist aesthetics is that you you splatter, you scratch, you scrawl, you uh, pour your guts out, you you know take a crap on the canvas if it helps you, and you know express yourself fully, and you mix it around, you stir it around a little bit, and 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 you come up with something that. Uh, has little to do with outward reality, but presumably has a lot to do with inward reality, how you're feeling, your attitude toward the world. And, and I think this piece does that to, to a certain degree. It, it expresses, a, a, I think, a rather pathetic, destructive view of the world upon which no one can build. It, it's a nihilistic vision of the world, a world of hopelessness, of grotesque, destroyed figures, figures perhaps destroyed by the reality of a world which is perhaps untenable in, in many of its instances. Humanity is perhaps dehumanized by many of the forces in the 20th century. And, and if anybody's been watching the program, you'll realize this has been a, perhaps a current, a continuous theme of the programs. And I would agree with de Kooning. But where I part company with de Kooning and artists of this order is when they offer no hope, when they say, okay, we've dived off the end of the dive, diving board and we're plunging down through space into an empty pool and we're about to splatter on the concrete. And, and these figures have splattered on the concrete, obviously. There's no, there's no hope, there's no alternative, there's no seeing any kind of beauty, any kind of dignity, any kind of meaning in the world, any kind of uh, redemptive aspects of, of human life or earthly life. It's all just plain hell. And uh, while there's a lot of hell, uh, I don't think it's all hell. And so I think the overstatement in pictures like this and the narrowness of, of statement uh, breed a hopelessness in the viewer. I mean, obviously, the artist himself is, is, is thoroughly hopeless. He's nihilistic. He has no redeeming vision of his own place in life, his own uh, meaning. He's, he's an old, old man now. He'll be dying soon. What, what is his attitude toward his own death? Um, has it all, is, it, is his life simply going to have been this kind of mad uh, expression of exacerbated, tormented nerves? Or, or will he have a, some kind of deathbed reconciliation with the ultimate forces of life? Uh, why wait till we die? Why create a lifetime of work that talks only of, of suffering and nihilism and, and with a certain amount of cynicism, I would say, a certain unredemptive quality? Why don't we 
attempt to move on from that point. Now, de Kooning uh, has a place, a basis in tradition. Oscar Kokoschka in 1914 painted this self-portrait with his mistress amidst the swirl of World War I beginning or about to begin, a total social unrest, strife, and struggle, and I think he expresses it. And it's called The Tempest or The Bride of the Wind. Uh, but I would say that perhaps the aesthetics of this painting are more attractive, if, if that's not too superficial a way of looking at it. There's a more, they're more cohesive. Uh, there's beauty in this, a certain beauty amidst the destructiveness that perhaps redeems the picture from utter hopelessness, although Kakashka on the left, the flesh seems to flap and fall off his body, uh, equating it with the surrounding uh, turbulence. Uh, but, but, but de Kooning, doing it 50 years later, maybe that's what ba is bothersome about de Kooning, at least for me, uh, 50 years of continual torment uh, uh, without redemption. Isn't it beating the same drum perhaps too long because it's, it deadens the spirit? It's, it's killing us. I think it's killing us to see symbols of our lives in the condition that de Kooning has left them and, and others have left them. Let's, let's look at a self-portrait by Kakashka painted in 1913, the year before the, the Tempest. Kakashka will be bayoneted in the chest and seriously wounded during the World War I. He'll lie on the field of battle for four days. And uh, what, is, what are we to gather about the meaning of the finger pointing at the breast? Is it is he having a premonition that he will be bayoneted in the chest? Or is it more likely that he's, he's saying as an individual caught up in the tempest of, of life in the early 20th century when all hell is breaking loose, he looks at us with those big eyes and he says, and that kind of pinch mouth, he says, what, what am I to do? How am I to maintain my individuality? What is my role in this madhouse? Say, and he, so he says, I, well, what is my by pointing at himself? He will lie on the field of battle for four days, as I said, uh, bayoneted in the chest. Uh, here's another self-portrait painted in 1917. Look at that same gesture. Has he See, unfortunately, I don't know enough about the timing, cr chronology of the painting to the actual bayoneting. Has he been bayoneted and he's recovered and he's pointing to his wound now in a specific sense? Uh, is he home on leave? And he hasn't been bayoneted yet, and he's saying to himself, what is my destiny? Still, you know, uh, after being in the war, maybe he hasn't gone to the war yet. Maybe he goes in the later World War I. Maybe that's something for you to look up, to say nothing of me. I'm doing the program. I, I should know it before I, I uh, talk about it. But you can draw your own conclusions. Find out for yourself what the precise meaning of it is. Certainly, four years later, 1917, this painting his painting stroke has loosened, has become disheveled in a sense. Look at the coat, has sort of fallen apart under the stress and, and nervous strain of events. And he stands before us, the helpless victim of his times, though still retaining his individuality and his ability to ask questions, whither am I going? You know, what, what is my fate? But when he is, when he does recover, he will paint portraits of himself reclining on the field of battle in large solitary figures, and he'll paint this figure called uh, Woman in Blue, painted in 1919. And I believe I'm not mistaken in saying that this is not a human being, that this is a painting of a life-size doll that Kakashka had made to his specifications. Now, you can let your imaginations run wild concerning the purposes that Kakashka might have had in mind for such a life-size doll and some of the reasons that lie behind it. And I would speculate that one of the reasons would be that he had a, an, a, an, a total inability to deal with real life humanity after the terrible experiences of World War I. That he was literally fed up to the gills with humanity, was so, uh, his, his nerves were so shattered, his, his body so shaken by the trauma of the experience and of his wounds that just to have someone alive in the same room with him, vibrating the energy of life, 
uh, was too much for his shattered constitution to bear, so that he took refuge in sort of a fantasy relationship with this doll woman, in a sense. And, and here she is reclining in, in a pseudo-sensuous pose with sort of a vacant expression on her face, emptied of, of all content, inner content, and human qualities. And in a sense, doesn't Kokoschka's shattered condition express something of our own shattered condition, or partially shattered condition, or minorly eroded condition, depending on what we actually are and how we view ourselves. Look at Philip Sherrod's uh, painting, a self-portrait with cityscapes and babies, painted in 1977. What, what is Sherrod saying in this painting? Isn't he saying something of the same thing that, that Kakashka was saying? that what will happen to my baby here? This is his own child that he holds, roughly painted in an expressionist way with bullseyes on the baby and bullseyes on himself. Uh, Sherrod says, as an artist, all the garbage that I've been through, all the social restrictions and conventions that I've had to battle to maintain my artistic individuality and my own individuality, what will this poor, helpless child do? What will he be? What will he be able to become under the restrictions and uh, deadly influences of contemporary life? So we're both targets, in a sense, he's saying. We're both potential victims, and I'm strong enough. I'm, I've lived through it, though not without pain. And look at the expression on his face, this sense of, you know, what, what is the baby going to do? There's a certain helpless helplessness there, and of course, it is a helpless position for any parent asking themselves what, what their child will do. So we're talking about victims, perhaps. And we look at this painting in 1889 of Vincent van Gogh, his self-portrait with bandaged ear. And van Gogh is a victim of both himself and of society, a, a society that doesn't understand him, that can't accept his revolutionary paintings, revolutionary because they express his own direct feelings of life, uncluttered by theory or contemporary fashions. And he suffers because he doesn't totally understand himself and his inner emotional needs, so that he's sort of in a death race with himself to fulfill himself before finally he runs out of the energy to sustain himself, to hold back the unconscious pressures, perhaps, that would destroy him. And eventually they do destroy him. And here in the bandaged ear we see him in his first attack upon himself, where he turns his frustrations, frustrations at not succeeding as an artist, human frustrations, frustrations at not succeeding as a human being, not having a love relationship, uh, having had a poor relationship with his parents. And we know, perhaps from our personal experience or just from reading in psychology, how damaging that can be. So that uh, he never was able to come to grips with his own inner being, his own inner torments, his difficulties with his father, um, if you want to get specific about it, and so that he was never able to come to grips with society in a sense, which is the, the father, the symbolic fa father in a psychological sense, so that he ran on the energy of life that young people have, and finally the energy ran out. It couldn't sustain him and his, the artificial structure, perhaps, he built up in himself to keep himself uh, afloat because he wasn't solidly founded, his, his personality didn't have a solid foundation, and he killed himself at the age of 37, shot himself. Now, this isn't to minimize his art in any way or to minimize him as a person. Though what I've just said is simply to help aid in our understanding of the depth of his work and his struggle as a human being. And, uh, but he sets the tone for the 20th century for all those with exacerbated nerves and, and feelings that are not fulfilled, that are stunted, as he felt his were, as he remarked in a letter. Uh, we find solace in Van Gogh because we're wounded, you know, in, in many ways, figuratively and perhaps literally, we attack ourselves. We, we chop off our ears. We uh, drive ourselves. We're workaholics. We're alcoholics. We're drug abusers. We're 
uh, petty thieves because we're somehow dissatisfied and we, we're trying to <clears throat> get the love of our parents or attack the society that doesn't recognize us or give us uh, personal fulfillment, this kind of thing. So uh, Van Gogh sets that tone and, and doesn't it continue in this portrait of a man in a green suit by Soutine, Haim Soutine, the 20th century expressionist and certainly one of the uh, direct heirs of Van Gogh in the 20th century. And we look at the uh, hand on the head, the head on the hand saying, what am I going to do? Pathetic. Look at it. The head's crushed and s stretched out, uh, pathetically distorted by uh, um, the pressures, interpersonal pressures and the pressures of society. And of course, we've talked about Willem de Kooning and we look at his painting Woman One. We're looking at the tortures of de Kooning and we're looking at the tortures that humanity suffers in the 20th century when it is ground down, when it is chopped meat, as this particular painting is. Now, I'm not saying all the 20th century has been this way and all aspects of life are this way. I, I don't think they are. But a substantial portion of it is, uh, more than 50 percent, I would say, without any question. And the artists suffering themselves are sensitive to it, respond to it, and express it. And, of course, uh, Edvard Munch in 1893 expresses the same modern futility, in a sense, the, the horror of life when life should be anything but horrible uh, if you have any luck at all. So, I mean, let's face it, there are terrible times in history. The plague strikes certain times, the, literally the, the, the physical disease, the black plague, and there are plagues of the spirit and plagues of the mind. And uh, if you're lucky, you live in a time when the plagues aren't as numerous as other times. Uh, but judging from what Munch's worldview here, he's saying that let me stop at my ears to not hear anymore the scream of the world or my own scream, which issues from my skull-like head, my ghost-like mouth, my loneliness <clears throat> as I stand on the bridge, zooming back in steam engine perspective to two figures in the background whom I'll never make contra contact with, the sky blood red and boiling and writhing, meeting the writhing, twisting quality, suffering quality of the earth. What a relief to leave the 20th century. Isn't it a relief? Let's, let's, let's have a little <laughs> nostalgia. Let's go back in time to the good old days, the 17th century, when Holland is battling the Spaniards for, <laughs> for their independence. And great painters like Jan Vermeer, in a masterpiece called The Milkmaid, somehow can express suffering, but can also talk about the magnificence of life, the magnificence of the beauty of life, the solidity of life, the substantiality of life, the meaning of life. See, in this solid torso of this milkmaid, in the pitcher of milk with that deep black cavernous hole from which emerges the life-giving light sparkling liquid, the crusty bread and rolls with diamond sparkles of light that seem almost uh, holy in a sense or magical in a deep, in a very profound sense, uh, expressing the meaning of the bread. All of these elements, the reality of them, help to sustain our own belief that life has meaning, that there is sub something substantial in it, that it's not just a, uh, what is it, a full of sound and fury, a tale told by an idiot. Uh, that certainly there are those aspects of it, but uh, what a magnificent piece of painting and so profound and, and the sadness on the face of the milkmaid. Will we ever know what her sadness is? Despite her magnificence and her full expression in life, is she limited by her social role in life? Does she yearn for something that expresses her personality and her being more deeply? 
does the window in this painting and the windows that are just rife in 17th century Dutch painting speak of some kind of psychic uh, closure upon the people as a whole and, and they yearn for the out of doors. In, in many of the Dutch pictures the windows will be open as if the interiors are sort of their places that imprison their psyches no matter how much they love their homes and the, the materiality of them and their pictures and their fruit and their furniture and the people that are in them. There, there's something beyond that they long for. Is, is, it, is it God who is symbolized by light that comes through the window and pervades everything? That God is the milk in a sense, the substance of life, the bread that we do not live by bread alone. Uh, is it simply freedom? Is it is it freedom to, to be oneself, to uh, burst the bonds of one's limitations? See, wh whatever the pregnant possibilities of, of life are or art are, uh, I think it's the purpose of art to explore them. Whenever we don't uh, give all we can to life as, as people, and when we don't give all we can to art, as artists, we're trapped in the superficial. We're trapped in the surface layers of living, of creation. And our artworks can't help but be superficial. They can't help but not deeply touch us. And because they don't deeply touch us and they don't deeply probe the issues of life and meaning that they need to, the people who look at those works are not anchored down. They're not sustained by the profundity and meaning of those artworks as symbols. It's, uh, artworks are symbols. They're full of meaning and they must be full of meaning to sustain us throughout life. I mean, we're surrounded by symbols in our lives and some are, are quite petty and some are quite uh, profound. I mean, the Camel cigarettes. The camel is, is a symbol of a certain kind of cigarettes. All kinds of, of products have their logos. You know, Coca-Cola has their logo. NBC has their, their logo. The cross is a symbol of Christ and the crucifixion, the unity of humanity focusing at a certain point by the two crossbars in a sense. And it becomes a more profound symbol because it touches more deeply into our souls than camel cigarettes do, unless we're deeply hooked on camel cigarettes. Uh, you know, that, that may be something else, too. So what these programs have been talking about is the fact that they need, art needs to be profound. We need it to be profound so that we feel that our lives have meaning. I think that's a problem today. We don't feel that our lives have that much meaning, and our art substantiates that very feeling. It's meaningless and superficial. Thanks for watching the program. It's been Artist and Critic. I'm Don Gray. We'll see you next time.